the church. How does the church work? In the church, you know, you've got the church manual and the working policy and things. God is receiving from you his rights. It's interesting. It's interesting to think about. If you had to close your church now because of some government thing that happened, could you maintain this congregation? Good morning, church. It's good that you can cross this planet from edge to edge. And on Sabbath morning, you can go, go somewhere, you can go in, and you can say that, and it'll be true. I'd like you to open your Bible to James chapter 4. We're going to start in sort of a dark place, but I promise you we're going to end in a very bright place. In James 4.4, 4, the inspired writer tells us that whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And that's a pretty grim thought, to be an enemy, an enemy of your maker. But here's what it says at verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So there's a desire to be a friend of the world. Now what you see here is a little bit of an outline of where we want to go today, uh, just so you kind of can keep up as we go through. Uh, that's the direction we're going. So I want to start by talking to you a little bit about the hollow church. When somebody wants, when we permit the desire within to rise up within us to become uh, like the world, God's, selfish, God's unselfish kingdom can't really be reconciled with that. And Satan has a self-indulgent kingdom, God has an unselfish kingdom, and so you have this inevitable, un unresolvable, uh, well it is resolvable, praise the Lord, but there's a conflict between selfishness and unselfishness. And you can tell, by the way, if you're looking at James chapter 4, that this, this command at verse 4, this is talking to the believer. Because look at verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Well, the spirit doesn't dwell in by choice. He doesn't dwell in the unbeliever. So this is, this is James is giving a command. He's telling the believers you believers in Jesus, make sure you don't let that desire for friendship with the world to rise up within. This is, this is a counsel for all of us. And yet there are people who are longing for the things of Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, Rome, and maybe California. I mean, less these days than in the past, but... You know, a church can change. A church can degenerate. From being a church filled with the Spirit, it can become a church that is devoid of the Spirit. It can become a hollow church. A hollow church is a denomination that has been repurposed. The first generation of a movement knows exactly what it's about. Its agenda is present truth. God has called and the believers have answered. A hollow church is a multi-generational church which has lost sight of its original reason for existing. Wearing the costume of the original, instead of truly advancing, it's retreating. Its original spirit-indicted commitment to distinct points of truth in its latter days gives way to other emphases. It degenerates until its main advocacy is for NPTAs. Well, what's an NPTA? A non-present truth agenda. And that doesn't really fall off the tongue too well, but it shouldn't, should it? <laughs> but that's what happens. A hollow church loses its path. 
and it become, begins to advocate uh, the uh, non-present truth agenda. And that's what happens. So what happens, you know, there are a few original spirit-led thinkers, and so focus degenerates to executing poorly copied ideas which originated in other groups. So the church becomes domesticated, it becomes very comfortably nestled into a moldering, low-traffic niche, insignificant in its world. And some people say of the church today, the church has become insignificant in its world. And perhaps part of that reason for that, it's hollow inside. God forbid we don't want that to happen to our church. But that's what happens. A church sinks into insignificance in moral matters while it replaces them with those mainstream narrative concerns that are highlighted in the secular culture. Actually, I was researching a few years back a certain topic, and I went to a, a, a church not of our denomination just to see what they were doing that morning and with relation to this topic, and I looked at their literature rack. They actually had one, which probably was a surprise. But uh, in their literature rack, they were advocating for all, and I mean basically all the same things that the secular were being advocated in the secular world. I mean, it was just like you could peel them off. I could have peel, peeled them all off and carried them away in my pocket, those little tracts. And I'd have had the whole agenda for the national, for the, the regular secular agenda. That was, that was their deal. It was sad. It sinks into silence and moral matters. And it replaces them with those mainstream narrative concerns that are highlighted in the secular culture. Members who convert, by the way, to, a, to the movement tend to have a different experience sometimes than members who grew up in the church. Now, this isn't absolute, but sometimes, you know, when you converted to follow the truth of the Bible, you may have had to give up a higher paying career. You may have given up a position that in a, in a job or something that you, you were planning to do, and now you had to take a lower paying position so you could keep the Sabbath holy. You... Uh, and sometimes people who grew up in the church, they begin, they sort of have this nagging feeling in the back of their mind. And you know, the devil, the devil presses on it with his thumb. This nagging feeling that, you know, maybe I missed something. I didn't do that crazy thing and that crazy thing and that crazy thing. I did all these things I was supposed to do. And the devil wants us to think, yeah, you, you probably missed some good stuff. I want to tell you, you didn't miss any good stuff. I, I converted. I didn't grow up... And, and, and I didn't, um, so some of those things were not good things. And so people kind of have an unhealthy fascination with things outside the movement. Who would even want to think that their own church could be in decline? You don't want to think that. Instead, what you want to think is, you know, you remember back to when you were baptized and all the positive and exciting things that happened then. You think about the good times the new friends you made, the new truths that you learned from this, from this special uh, blessing that God has revealed to us, His holy book. And you always associate it with the good things. And sometimes we even judge our own uh, institutions not on what they have become today, but what they were 40 years ago. And that's a little bit dangerous because I want to tell you, things are happening so fast. What is the saying that says uh, there are there are decades, there are days in which, decades, there are decades in which things seem to happen like a day. That's not quite it, but. Have you noticed how rapidly things are changing in our world? Used to be things would last a long time. You think of a generation as maybe like 40 years, and maybe then things would change rather dramatically in a span of 20 years. But friends, today, is today even remotely like it was five years ago. The world is changing very, very rapidly. And so the institutions that were doing awesome things decades and decades ago, today, that's an open question. In fact, maybe in some cases it's less of an open question. But sometimes we join the church because of, largely because of influence from family members. And without anyone really intending for it to have happened, 
uh, newer generations are less tested, they're less trialed, and sometimes even younger generations are even confused about the message. What is the message? If somebody took you aside and locked you in a room for 10 minutes and recorded all of us, would we give a solid explanation for why I choose to be a Christian, why I choose to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? What happens is that a hollow church publishes back to the world the same complaints and initiatives as the secular culture around it. If the culture is clamoring about climate change, so is the church. If the Kool-Aid of the hour is social justice, social justice will begin to be emphasized in the church. And if the society is tilting into authoritarianism, the hollow church will be tilting into authoritarianism. Meanwhile, the message of the original movement is continually re-explained by the professional denominational in-group until it has been so stripped of power that it no longer embarrasses. It no longer embarrasses because the message it delivers no longer matters. And now you're talking about a hollow church. A lot of people no longer know what we are. And I think it would be well for us to pause and spend some time together thinking about Protestantism. What is Protestantism? And you might ask yourself, am I a Protestant? The psalmist helps us to understand. Let's open our Bible again now. Let's flip it over to Psalm 119. That might help us. Psalm 119, verses 41 to 48. I want to begin here. By the way, in a few moments you're going to perhaps, well, I hope, see how, how curious it is how similar some of the things that we're experiencing in the world today are to the way things were in 500 years ago. So, hold that thought. Psalm 119, verse 41 to 48. Listen to this uh, as we pull from the psalmist. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And, I, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Now listen. I will speak your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on, I will think about your statutes, your word. As beings made in God's image, we are to walk at liberty. But Satan works through humans to oppress. And there will be occasions when we, where we either submit like cowards and compromise our morality, or we will stand up for what is right, and we will give an answer before human authorities. We will, the psalmist tells us, we will sometimes speak before kings, rulers, and presidents. Some will be harassed and persecuted. It's no doubt some will be imprisoned and some murdered. This is not all past history. Some of this is yet future, although perhaps not so far future. The word Protestant traces back to the protest of the princes in the 1520s. Ellen White in the book, The Great Controversy, page 197, writes, and I hope you'll notice something in our passage here, the courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God. She's talking about the early Protestant reformers. The courage, faith, and firmness of those men of God gained for succeeding ages 
liberty of thought and of conscience. Their protest gave to the Reformed Church the, the name Protestant. Its principles are the very essence of Protestantism. Now look again at this quotation, and you know, usually what do we talk about? We talk about liberty of conscience. I want to suggest to you that there are two, not one, two key pieces here. There is liberty of thought, and there's liberty of conscience. The Protestant reformers stood for us in the gap in that time, not so that we could merely have liberty of conscience, which, which we, we want, but also for liberty of thought. Kind of interesting. Now, again, look at our quotation. Courage, faith, and firmness go together. Those three traits, courage, faith, and firmness. By the way, how do you think those, those three traits would play today in today's world? Wouldn't that sound like intolerance and uh, bigotry and, and, and stubbornness and dinosaurness, if that's a word? These men were standing against the combined might of church and state. How tiny seemed their power in relation to what was then called the Holy Roman Empire ruled by Emperor Charles V. Charles V. By 1520, the lands ruled by Charles were vast and included almost all of Europe and colonies as far away as Africa and America. This guy was big stuff. Charles was a staunch Roman Catholic. He fought many wars. Often the foes that he vanquished, he had a solution for stubbornness. It involved chopping the head off. The full power of church and state were closely united in Charles. We often think of religious liberty in terms of Liberty of conscience, but as I say to you here, there are two categories, liberty of thought and also liberty of conscience. Arguably, you have to have liberty of thought before you have liberty of conscience, because you don't know what to think and to have a, a moral reaction to if you don't have the first one, liberty of thought. When Charles V sought to rub out Lutheranism, he sought not only to prescribe conscience, but also freedom of thought. Listen to this. Even, I don't have a slide for this one, but even in private homes, the emperor forbade the gospel to be preached or spoken. There was a whole range of thought that was forbidden. I want you to consider this excerpt from 1521 from the Edict of Worms. This is an edict that went out, and these were things that were, this is what it said. He's talking about Pope Leo X. It says, now this is January 1, 1521, so 500 years ago. He, Pope Leo X, declared that those books, he's talking about the, particularly here in context, the writings of Luther, those books, in whatever language they are written, would have to be burned and taken out of the people's memory forever. We ask and require that no one dare to compose, write, print, paint, sell, buy, or have printed, written, sold, or painted from now on in whatever manner such pernicious articles so much against the holy orthodox faith and against that which the Catholic apostolic church has kept and observed from this day. We likewise condemn anything that speaks against the Holy Father, against the prelates of the church, and against the secular princes, the general schools and their faculties, and all other honest people, whether in positions of authority or not. And in the same manner, we condemn everything that is contrary to the good moral character of the people, to the Holy Roman Church, and to the Christian public good. Is that chilling? Does that sound a little bit like cancel culture? Isn't that interesting? So this edict utterly forbade any criticism of all of the main elements of society. Did you hear what I read? Against this extreme power to counsel, every word and thought 
stood a handful of German princes, men described by Ellen White as persons of courage, faith, and firmness. These men came of age under the one and only Roman Catholic Church, and yet through study of the Scriptures and the teaching and preaching of those who came to be called Protestants, they transcended the influences and powers there and stood in defense of liberty in their midnight hour. I mean, it looked like everybody was against him. The, the emperor is against him. All of his armies are against him. The, the whole church is against him. There is no Protestant church. It's like if you ask the child, name the churches. Can you name all the churches on one finger? The child would have to say, yes, Daddy, the Roman Catholic Church. It's the church. So there weren't little, lots of little extra options. In 1526, each state had been granted, each of these German states had been granted a freedom in religious matters on a temporary basis. Let me tell you how this would work. So this was temporary. There was a new diet that was a meeting, kind of like a big uh, meeting of, of rulers, that was convened for spires in 1529. Emperor Charles' purpose was to crush the Reformation, so he worked out this compromise. Here's how it works. He, would grant the, he granted Lutheran dominions limited liberty, but only as a privilege, not as a right. So no new conversions would be allowed. No Catholic would be permitted to convert to Lutheranism. It would be forbidden to give a Bible study disagreeing with any papal teaching. You couldn't give a Bible study to your own kid that was different from the Roman Catholic doctrine. Couldn't do it. So the Reformation really had come to the brink. They had reached a point. The decisions, if this, these decisions that were reached in 1529, and I want to say to you, now pay attention, these decisions were reached in this giant meeting, and the majority said yes. They agreed to the compromise. We'll allow a little bit of, little bit of Protestantism, just a little bit, but that they will die out. And then we'll all be happy Catholics again. And the majority said, what choice do we have? The majority said yes. The majority voted yes. So what happened? Charles' representative demanded the submission of the princes. Hey, the majority voted it too. So it's like, all you've got to do is just sign here. But the princes wrote a protest, and they delivered it at the end of the Diet on April 20 in 1529. Sometimes these meetings went on for, for a long period of time. The emperor's representative refused to take it. He wouldn't take it from their hand when they handed it to him. He, he pulled his hands back, and he said, no, all that, all that is left is your submission. And we're not, I, I'm commanded not even to receive it. So that was like the last day of the meeting. They were done. What happened? So uh, it wasn't received on April 24, 20, but on April 24, the princes published their document. You might want to hear a few pieces of what they said. So let me read it to you again, some portions. This is, by the way, where you get the name, where you and I where we get the name Protestant. We protest before God, our only creator, preserver, redeemer, and savior, and who will one day be our judge, as well as before all men and all creatures, that we, for us and our people, neither consent nor adhere in any manner whatever to the proposed decree in anything that is contrary to God, to his word, to our right conscience, or to the salvation of our souls. We cannot assert that when Almighty God calls a man to his knowledge, he dare not embrace that divine knowledge. I, I'm not reading the whole thing, just some pieces. There is no true doctrine but that which conforms to the word of God, the Lord forbids the teaching of any other faith. The Holy Scriptures with one text explained by other and plainer texts are in all things necessary for the Christian, easy to be understood, 
and adapted to enlighten. We are therefore resolved by divine grace to maintain the pure preaching of God's only word as it is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments without anything added thereto. This word is the only truth. It is the sure rule of all doctrine and life and can never fail or deceive us. He who builds on this foundation shall stand against all the powers of hell, whilst all the vanities that are set up against it shall fall before the face of God. Now they went on to say, I won't read it, but they went on to say, um, we also, we're ready to obey his, you know, we're ready to obey the emperor in all things. But, um, but they said this, let's see. Yeah, we declare ourselves ready to pay unto him as well as unto you, gracious lords, all the affection and obedience that are our just and legitimate duty. But you know what they said when it comes to the word of God? They as much as said, we will not obey. And that's the beginning of Protestantism. And some people look at what's going on today and we say, my, oh my, but there's a spirit of conformity and compliance in our world today. And the spirit of Protestantism doesn't shine very brightly today in some of the world. The historian Merle de Abenye, right, commented on this protest of the princes and he, he said this, by their protest, the princes had lifted the power of conscience above that of the state and the authority of the Holy Scriptures above the visible church. They presented a solemn witness against religious intolerance and an assertion of the right of all men to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Ellen White wrote this, Great Controversy 201. To protect liberty of conscience is the duty of the state, and this is the limit of its authority in matters of religion. Every secular government that attempts to regulate or enforce religious observances by civil authority is sacrificing the very principle for which the evangelical Christian so nobly struggled. So you see, in God's order, the state has only and exactly one duty with reference to religious services, to protect liberty of conscience and freedom of thought. That is the duty of the state. It is forbidden, look at the quote, it is forbidden even to regulate a religious observance as much as it's prohibited from enforcing one. But three years ago, we sort of wound up getting regulated Interesting. The state is a part of God's ordering of the world with strictly limited powers, and yet history shows again and again how state powers overrun their boundaries and oppress. There are matters of right in which even the majority has no right, no true right to overrule the conscience of the individual. And I'm thankful for these, these tiny group of princes who even though the majority had said, we submit. They said, we do not, and we will not. And that's a little piece of Protestantism. When we consider the heritage, our heritage as Protestants, we, have, we will have a boldness like the early church did. Go to Acts chapter 4. I want to look at a quick story here, and then we'll talk about Protestantism a little bit more. Acts chapter 4, because again, I don't see Protestantism being widely understood or pointed to, and I can only imagine that it won't be long and there will be people talking about Protestantism as just a, one of those bad, nasty things in history. But I want to tell you that it's near the foundation of your faith and mine. Here's a story in Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read it all the way through, starting at verse 13. 
Because I think you'll find that faith, courage, and firmness that we read about, that Ellen White mentioned, I think we'll find it here in these men of God in Acts chapter 4. Listen. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with him, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Yeah, that was a firm response, wasn't it? Was it disrespectful? No? They kind of left it. Well, you, you judge whether it's right. Is this a right thing to, to do what you say or what God says? It was very spirit-led, I believe. So here they were, men of courage, faith, and firmness, and I say, if you and I would be Protestants, we must be men and women of courage, faith, and firmness. When oppression presses down on us, we too will ask the question, is it right in the sight of God to listen to men more than to God? Protestants. Well, there's only one kind of Protestant. At least you might say there's only one kind that usually gets emphasized. I want to suggest to you, though, that historically, uh, and it's unambiguously true, there are three essential kinds or L are kinds of Protestantism, and each of these should inform our experience as Christians today. So you have the great apostasy, and out of that, God brings back the Protestant Reformation. And yes, it begins with Luther, and uh, here you have a picture on the screen. There's, there's Martin at the top, and uh, we have... Zwingli, and we have uh, Calvin. John Calvin is the next picture there. And those are called the magisterial reformers. 1517, we begin with Luther and we come along. And those are often viewed as being the main uh, root of the Reformation. And they were kind of first. You know, Luther, Luther has his protest against indulgences and onward things go. And magisterial is a word that means uh, the great teachers. So these are Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they were considered to be the great teachers. And so um, their emphasis was, was the impulse of, the, of their approach was not primarily to discard Catholicism, not at first, but to reform it. The, see, these guys, they wanted to fix errors that had developed. So Luther's emphasis on stopping the use of indulgences, ending a misunderstanding of the Mass, and pushing back against the abuses of the popes, that was what the emphasis was on. But correcting many of the errors of church tradition, like infant baptism, purgatory, or other, other errors of the church fathers, that was really never in their plan. Luther did not plan to start a, a, a movement. Luther just thought, I'm going to write this out, I'll hold a debate, and uh, we'll get all this straightened out. The church will, this is truth, so it'll just be accepted. The Pope will be happy. The Pope wasn't happy. <laughs> Sorry, Martin, the Pope wasn't, wasn't happy. So anyway, that's the first group. And by the way, when we look at uh, most, most uh, publications or stories that we read about the Protestant Reformation or, or our, uh, our connection to the Protestant Reformation, you'll see almost everything tra tracking back to Luther, Luther and Calvin, the magisterial reformers. The truth is that at the early Seventh-day Adventist Church, there were almost no Lutherans that joined us. Okay, we're glad, we're glad for that heritage. We do have a connection with the religious liberty, peace, and all that, but, but those weren't the first Adventists. 
And, uh, but those are good things there. But again, their plan wasn't to discard error. Their plan was to just you know, fix some mistakes, but, but just keep moving. So the second kind of Protestantism doesn't really have a widely known name. I guess we, we, I've seen it called the Elizabethan Reformation. Sometimes it's called the English Reformation. Uh, there's King Henry VIII. He had a problem. He needed to have a male heir to the throne. And uh, so he, he was marrying. Back then, they knew that men and women kind of like were men and women. So uh, <laughs> it's only 500 years ago, you know. A lot can happen, I guess. But uh, he, couldn't get a, he couldn't get a male heir. He couldn't have children. And so he, he wanted to divorce from his wife because, and by the way, this went on, and apparently the problem probably wasn't the ladies. He, he probably had a fertility issue himself. But anyways, um, he wanted a divorce from his wife so he could marry another one so he could, you know, have a child, that would become and grow up and become the king. The pope said, sorry, I'm not going to grant you a divorce. And King Henry said, well, sayonara. That's how the Church of England began. Now, out of the Church of England uh, came also the Wesleys, and we have the beginning of the Methodist movement and so on. So that's the second branch of the Reformation, uh, sort of comes out of Methodism. By the way, most of the early Adventists at that time in America, the biggest church in America, Methodists. Most of our converts at the very beginning were Methodists, Methodists and Baptists. So this is where we get a, a key part, a key root. The Wesleys began the holiness movement, and that eventually separated from the Church of England, and that's how we get our beginning. We call it, I guess, the Elizabethan Reformation. It's characterized by a pragmatic and a practical attitude. Putting away erroneous traditions wasn't really their main interest, but making changes directly affecting personal experience, that kind of makes sense, and, and that's kind of what they were doing. Um, King Henry at the beginning, yeah, that's probably not the best beginning for things, but anyway, that's the second branch. And today, there's kind of a, that's a significant branch of the Reformation. There's a third branch called the Radical Reformation. And you, um, uh, let's try this experiment here. How many of you, raise your hand if you recognize and you think you can name the man at the bottom by the 1527. Raise your hand if you think you can identify him. Okay, that's a zero. Uh, the man above him in the oval, raise your hand if you think you can identify him. Okay, and that's a zero. Menno Simmons is the man at the bottom, and John Smith. You might remember Menno Simmons is the beginning of the Mennonites and the Amish and those kinds of things, and John Smith is the beginning of the Baptists. By the way, we as a church are thankful for the Baptists because there was a group of Baptists that come out of this. This is the Radical Reformation. So what's the difference about the Radical Reformation? What is their angle? The spirit that animated the Radical Reformation was one of restoration, the technical words are recapitulation or restatement. Rather than trying to reform the traditions of the church, the impulse of the Radical Reformation was to go back, go back and throw away all the tradition and craft that has developed, throw it all away, let's go back to the beginning of the early church, let's follow the scriptures, and if it's not in the Bible, we're going to get rid of it. And that's why out of the radical, ref radical means root. Let's go back to the root. That's where it gets its name. And that's why the Seventh-day Baptists rose out of the Baptists, because they were the Radical Reformation. And one day in the 1800s, there was a discussion going on, and a little lady in the back row of her church talked to her pastor and said, Pastor, why aren't we keeping the seventh day? And our understanding of the Seventh-day Sabbath came to us through a sister who was a Seventh-day Baptist. We get the Seventh-day Baptist from the Radical Reformation. And that impulse to keep the Sabbath holy, to throw away weird ideas about the Second Coming, go back to the Bible for the true ideas, to throw away weird ideas about, you name it, I guess, and go back to what the Bible says. That's the principle that's at the root of the Radical Reformation. You are not only a Christian. You're not only a monotheist and a monotheist who's a Christian. You're not only a Christian, you're a Protestant. You're not only a Protestant, 
You're a Protestant with all three of these pieces, the magisterial angle, the, the, the English Elizabethan angle, but you're also ultimately a radical Reformation piece because you, above, uh, different from all the other churches in your city perhaps, you're the Sabbath-keeping church. So radical Reformation is part of who you are. It's part of your, your theological, historical DNA. Sorry, you guys, you're radicals. Sorry. <laughs> now, all three of these are good pieces. They're all important. We want to get rid of the error, uh, you know. Um, we want to be practical, have a practical, godly faith, you know, in, in, in a personal walk with Jesus. And we want to be Bible people. But that, you might not have known all these things, but this is one reason why you came here and became a Seventh-day Adventist in your experience because the Holy Spirit of God led you and you wanted to get into the Word. You want to be a person of the Word. And so you are a Protestant. These things we've talked about are not non-Protestant. These are Protestant. And uh, by the way, some of these Protestants, I mean, let's just be honest, some of these Protestants beat up the other Protestants. The Radical Reformation is where we get um, believers' baptism. Yeah, over here in the Lutheran Reformation, you can go on the internet today and read about how they do infant baptism still because they couldn't, didn't get rid of that Catholic error. But the, the radical reformers were doing, in, they were getting rid of infant baptism. And the other, the Catholics and the other Protestants said, you can't do that. Babies are baptized at birth, they're sprinkled. You're not re-baptizing them. They said, well, we, we go with just believer's baptism. People know what they're getting into. They make a choice. So they said, no, that's not allowed. And they said, well, yes, yes it is. That's what we're going to do. And so they were persecuted by other Catholics and other Protestants. One of the ways they persecuted the Radical Reformation Christians was to drown them. They said, you want to be rebaptized? We'll drown you. Sometimes the ladies, the wives, were buried with their husband because they refused to give up their faith. Sometimes they took them out on a lake and dumped them in the water, and that's how they were killed. Radical reformers. And, and so today you look at those pictures and the, the different groups kind of view the other group as not legitimate. We're legitimate, but they're not. So uh, consequently today, well, there's so many, been so much decline in the, uh, in the churches that um, Adventists are kind of, kind of more substantial than, than we used to be. But, uh, but a lot of churches still, if they really, if you pressed them about whether we're real Christians or not, a lot of them are going to say, no, those people are a weird cultic group. I read it on the internet, so I know it's true. If you want to find out more about this, you all have a book on your shelf. Shame on you if you haven't read it in recent time. It's called The Great Controversy. These are some page numbers if you want to read about. Uh, out of the Radical Reformation, you get a fanatical group. Ellen White comments on that. Uh, but anyway, you won't find a lot about the Radical Reformation there, but there's some pages that talk about it. Uh, there's many chapters on Luther, and there's nothing wrong with those. Those are all very powerful material. But I would say that today in our church, there are many forces at work to diminish our memory or our understanding of who and what we are and of the principles on which we stand. And it's so interesting how much of the scholarly energy today seems to be bent on erasing our Anabaptist heritage, the Radical Reformation heritage, while emphasizing an almost non-existent magisterial connection. Really, friends, we are, uh, we're more Radical Reformation. And again, glad for Luther, though. We're not, we're not bumping Luther. Uh, this is just an aside. Um, at the end of time, you know, there's going to be an alliance between church and state. You might have heard that somewhere. Um, these three groups, these three branches of the Reformation, the Magisterial, Elizabethan, and Radical branches, how do you think they're going to be with church and state connecting? See, the Radical Reformation, to them, Constantine is a bad guy. Remember Emperor Constantine, the first Sunday law? That was a blend of church and state. That was kind of like, no, no. So the Radical Reformers see Constantine as a bad guy. But Luther... Read about what Luther and Calvin say about Constantine. Constantine was actually a good guy. He was bringing Christianity to the masses. 
who do you think is going to align in this alliance of church and state? It won't be the it shouldn't be the radical reformers. It will perhaps be those who don't see a problem with church and state blending together. Anyway, that's kind of an aside. Let's move on. I promised you some uh, some joyful pieces. Hopefully, you're already joyful about Protestant. But um, let's talk a little bit about a clear purpose. You might have noticed that spiritual advancement in each of these three Protestant impulses seems to have stopped. Have you noticed that? Are the Lutherans doing any big reforms right now? Did you hear about that? No, you didn't hear about it because it's not happening. What about the Baptists? Are they doing any big reforms right now? No, you haven't heard about it, and the reason why is because it's not happening. Now, there are divisions. Some are separating and forming new groups to uphold those positions uh, that they maybe had a couple of centuries ago. The Methodists right now, the United Methodists. Don't ever put United in your name. The United Methodists are splitting uh, because they've been totally taken over by LGBTQ plus and all that business. So they're splitting, and, and there's a group there of really serious Christian people among the Methodists who want to, want to be true to the Bible, true to the things that they, their church used to teach 200 years ago. There's a group that's breaking off and trying to be faithful. Good for them. They, they need to come a little further. Now, I've got a suggestion for them where they might go, but uh, it starts with an S. But, uh, but anyways, thankful for people trying to be faithful. But there's really not any indication there are really new advances in spiritual understanding happening. Now that's where you and I come in, right? Our church is God's plan for the continuation of the Reformation. But, but is that a fair description of us now? I would say it would be very generous to claim that we are presently advancing rapidly in Reformation. Sorry. We need to have clear purposes. We need to know why we exist and then seek the Holy Spirit to help us in the homeward direction. Now here's the thing. Clarity in action can only follow clarity concerning God's will. That What I'm trying to say is, when a movement is clear about the Bible and the message that it's called to bear to the world, then and only then is that movement going to advance. Does that make sense? What is our message? So when you peel away all the layers, what is the mission which God has assigned to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Now, you'll think of different answers. We might say that our mission is to make disciples. Our mission is to baptize, spread the gospel. And of course it is. We'll say that our mission is to give the third angel's message. Yes, yeah, yes it is. But again, if we locked everybody in the room across the street and interviewed you privately, individually, for 10 minutes each and asked you, tell, tell me, I want to know, what is the third angel's message? Now my guess is this church would do a lot better than most. But uh, I'm thinking we might not all score A's on God's sheet. So friends, we want to know what our mission really is. And so what did God call us for? Why does God want there to be a Protestant Reformation? What ultimately? Why do we make disciples and baptize and do evangelism and, and do all the different things we do? Why? And I'm going to suggest to you today as part of a sermon about Protestantism, that God's plan, God's mission, our mission, is to prepare people for translation. Translation. From Greek to English. No, that's not it. What is translation? Open your Bible over there now to Hebrews 11 and verse 5. I want to study with you just a little bit here in the last part of our talk about translation. See, Hebrew, uh, uh, translation? We don't have a doctrine about translation. Hebrews 11, verse 5. Now, if you have the King James Version, 
You'll find the word translation there. If you have the New King James, as I do here, you probably won't find that word there quite, but it's, it's there three times in that verse. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. He had been translated. For before he was taken, before he was translated, it says, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, wait a minute. I heard theologically that we can't please God. Everything we do is tainted and corrupted, and there's nothing that we can do that will please God. Well, I guess we're not, I guess Enoch's just a different guy. Because when I read it here, it said he had this testimony. And where do you get that testimony that Enoch pleased God? From the Holy Spirit that tells the Bible writer to tell you, to tell me, that God was pleased with Enoch. When God let Enoch into the kingdom, he didn't, well, I guess he doesn't have a nose, but he didn't just barely accept him. Enoch was welcomed with open arms. God loved him. He says, come up here. You've been down there. Come on, let's spend some time up here. And God took him. God wanted him there. God was glad to see him. And God made sure that he went there. And God did not hold his nose when Enoch entered the kingdom. The angels didn't all kind of quietly move to the side like, you know, we can't trust him. They were glad to see Enoch come. Paul walks through this faith list in Hebrews 11. Do you know that Enoch is the second person named? If you go through the, the hall here in Hebrews 11, second person named. Enoch's exercise of faith was central as he cooperated with the divine. To be translated literally means to transfer from one place to another. Far from displeasing God, Enoch pleased him, and God took him. Genesis 5, if you want to study it sometime. Now, let me give you a little quotation here. There we go. That's verse 5. Now, this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, and this is on two or three panels, but it's worth it. All right? In the midst of a world by its iniquity doomed to destruction, Enoch lived a life of such close communion with God that he was not permitted to fall under the power of death. Does that sound pretty close to you? Such close. The godly character of this prophet represents the state of holiness. I didn't write this, friends. I'm just, I typed it. I didn't write it. The state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth. Future tense at the time of Christ's second advent. Does that sound like a part that maybe could apply to us? But anyway, I'm not being fair to you. Let me continue reading. Then, as in the world before the flood, iniquity will prevail. Does that sound like our time? Following the promptings of their corrupt hearts and the teachings of a deceptive philosophy, Men will rebel against the authority of heaven. Does that sound like our day? Yeah, well, she's not done yet. But like Enoch, God's people, what are they going to do? But like Enoch, God's people will seek for purity of heart and conformity to his will. Not conformity to the world, conformity to his will, until, so they keep seeking, until they shall reflect, this is, an amazing, this is an amazing statement, until they shall reflect the likeness of Christ. Like Enoch, like, like who? Like Enoch, they will warn the world of the Lord's second coming and of the judgments to be visited upon transgression and by their holy conversation and example, that's their holy behavior, Old English, they will condemn the sins of the ungodly. And finally, to finish the statement, as Enoch was translated to heaven before the destruction of the world by water, so the living righteous will be translated from the earth before its destruction by fire. And I want to say to you, what I just read to you, I believe, is one of the most Protestant things you can say.
This word of translation, we find it also in Colossians 1.13. It says, There God who has delivered us from the power of darkness, hath King James Version, translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Okay, so this is a Bible idea. It's not just in one place. It's, it's, it's in different places. If you follow this passage, by the way, we won't take the time for it today, but if you were to study Colossians chapter, chapter uh, 1, and you look at what's going on in those passages, let me just summarize for you. Verses 9 to 11, it talks about praying and asking to understand God's will. It talks about walking worthy and being strengthened. Then in verse 12, it says, and we are, par- we are partakers of the inheritance. Verse 13, Colossians 1, God has delivered us from the power. He's translated us into the kingdom. That's the verse there. And if you look at verses 14 to 20, it puts the preeminence of Jesus. Because every time, you know, Paul's going along and talking and he starts talking about Jesus, usually there's about a 10-verse detour where he, he can't help but talk about how, how, how precious Jesus is to him. And then you finally go to verse 21 to 24, and if, you're, if you have it open to Colossians 1, I want you to notice what it says there. And yet, the believer is reconciled, and suddenly we get these ifs. Uh-oh, these ifs? Yes. The believer is reconciled if indeed he continues in the faith, if he continues grounded and steadfast, and if he's not moved away from the hope of the gospel, verse 24. The same word for transfer or to remove to another place, it's used in other places. We won't look them up. 1 Corinthians 13.2 talks about removing mountains. Remember, if you have uh, faith like a mustard seed, you know, you can cause mountains to move. Acts 13.22, after God had removed Saul, he made David king. Luke 16.4, the embezzling steward resolves what he's going to do when he's removed from the stewardship, when he is translated from the stewardship and he's he's in trouble, he's going to follow up his other corruption that he's kind of planned out ahead of time. So this word, that's a little, we won't go to the whole word study. I do want you to know, however, that translation is not automatic. We are transferred only if we are immovable, if we are sealed, if we are settled into the truth so definitely that we've given ourselves to Jesus without uh, without reserve. So that then is our ultimate mission, to be used by heaven to help people come so close to Jesus that they're so united in unselfishness that so immovably joined to Jesus that they would rather die than choose sin. They would be so committed to God's present truth agenda that an MPTA agenda, a non-present truth agenda, is repulsive to them. And so, yes, Pastor, that's one of the reasons we have a little bit of friction sometimes within our church. Because sometimes we have people who are coming up and pulling out of their pockets all these non-present truth agendas. And they're not necessarily all wrong, but the, the agenda for this hour is to prepare people for translation. It's just what it is. The purpose, if the purpose of the Reformation was to bring the church back to the place where it could prepare people for translation, if God raised us up to finish the Reformation, then he raised us up to see people prepared for translation. So now the last thing I want to say to you, just briefly then, these three Protestant emphases, we saw them in the three branches of the Reformation, to reform what is broken, to make practical and personal changes so that we grow spiritually, to restore the faith and worship of the early church. These three Protestant principles are part of what it means to be pro- they're part they're what it means to be Protestant. None of these traits are possible or likely if we permit ourselves to lose the interest in present truth that is the very reason that God raised us up to be his end time movement. Remember that we spoke uh, we spoke at, about last night. The church is a global network of believers. There's a local mission structure, the local congregation. There's a distant mission structure. So, yes, you send missionaries or you fund people to go on missions. Uh, Those are pieces of things that we do. The church is organized for service. The church, uh, we want to be helping people come to the Lord Jesus. We need to have mission continuity. If, If something happens, God forbid, the church gets closed again by the government, and it will, can you keep meeting? Uh, we need to plan for that. We need to be ready for that. And three years ago, we weren't ready for that. 
We just weren't. Let's just be honest. We failed. We did not get in. We did not pass. Now, praise the Lord. We soon came back to meeting, but but uh, this church is organized for service. God led our spiritual ancestors to create our church institutions, not for the sake of the institutions, but for the sake of mission. Man was not made for the church, but the church was made for man. We are not here to perpetuate institutions, but to live and give the third angel's message so that hearts are drawn close to Jesus and prepared for translation. Church organization exists to equip and organize for action. And from time to time, the church needs to revisit why it's here. What are its purposes? Why are we doing what we're doing? Sometimes we need to strip away stuff that is accumulated. And remember why God put us here. We need to keep in our minds and hearts God's end time plan for us. And so I want to offer you the last thing here. I'm going to give you one last paragraph. I want you to listen and ask yourself, what does my God want to do for me in these closing hours of planet Earth? And this paragraph is from a little book you may have on your shelf called Early Writings. And yes, the word translation appears in this paragraph. Here we go. In this hour of trial, the saints were nervous and concerned. In this hour of trial, down at the far end, we're at the end of time, the saints were calm and composed, trusting in God and leaning upon His promise that a way of escape would be made for them. In some places, before the time for the decree to be executed, this is the death decree, the wicked rushed upon the saints. They were ready to kill them now. But angels in the form of men of war fought for them. Satan wished to have the privilege of destroying the saints of the Most High, but Jesus bade his angels watch over them. God would be honored by making a covenant with those who kept his law in the sight of the heathen round about them, and Jesus would be honored by translating, without their seeing death, the faithful waiting ones who had so long expected him. There's a hymn in our, in our hymnal, and one of the lines says, uh, In the morning when I die, in the morning when I die. I don't like that line. I plan to walk into the kingdom. If God so wills it, I'm going to skip the funeral part, and I'm going to be translated, and I'm going to walk into the kingdom. Would you like that? Yes. Now, it may or may not be that way for you or for me, but friends, give me Jesus. That's the way the hymn goes on. That part I like. God the Father, it says, will be honored by making... Uh, how could it be that God would be honored by making a covenant with those who had kept His law? But that's what it says. God will be honored by you and I. And, the, and then Jesus. See what it says? Jesus would be honored, and He would show that. He would do that by, by translating without their seeing death, the faithful waiting ones who so long had expected him. I said at the beginning, we kind of start in a dark place, and we'd end in a very bright place, brothers and sisters. I believe I've fulfilled that. Friends, the days ahead are glorious indeed, but to get there we cannot be a hollow church. Never happen that way. We will have to be authentic and actual Protestants. All right. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, you placed us here in these intense times. What were you thinking? 
but this is, this is the best plan. We don't feel adequate, Lord. We feel kind of small and confused and who me? But Lord, it's your plan. When we were born, this was your design. This is your plan for us. Lord, may we, re may we rejoice, Lord, that when you took Enoch into heaven, you were pleased. And we rejoice to understand that even though we feel inadequate, even though we feel lower than worms and, and useless, and that we've failed you, and we know, and you know that we've failed you before, even so, Lord, we are thankful this Sabbath morning to know that when, when you invite us through, when we're translated, if that happens in our lifetime, you will receive us with pleasure. Jesus, even be honored. So, Lord, these are amazing thoughts. We are humbled before you. Thank you for your beauty and goodness. Lord, please help our hearts to be opened wider and do a work in us now that needs to be done so this can all be finished and we can move on and finally get into the cosmic kindergarten that we've been waiting to get into. Now, Lord, bless us and bless this church as we continue today to follow Thee and study and be, be encouraged on the way to the kingdom. We ask for these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.